And we're live. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's Tai Chi weapons in Wednesday morning, so we're going to do the Tai Chi Saber. Uh, some of you have been following. Um, you can watch if you have missed a lot of them, but uh, most of the people um, that have been following probably know the form. So we're going to just go through that and uh, review some of the different postures. All right. So typically, we already did some warm up for this, but uh, that was in the 24. So we're just going to stroke just to move the sword in the different slicing directions. We have the vertical. That's up. turning one, two. Just get the body turning, slicing, going up and up and up and up. Okay. 45 degree slices, say 10 degree slices to the waist, over the head, below palm, poke, lift, lower, horizontal, horizontal. Slicing 45 degrees, coming back to center, 45 degrees. So this is just the blade without the stance. Now if we go like this, this would be diagonal flying. Shift your weight, diagonal flying, okay? So we'll go through the form first, and then we'll see what we need to work on, all right? Preparation. Left foot forward, <clears throat> press forward, sit back and turn the corner. Vertical to horizontal, roll back and push. Turn, brush down and push. Sit back, make a circle, grasp the sword, bring the hand underneath. Get to the back, sort of, and push. One, two, three, four, and five. Come down, lift one, push forward, turn. Over the top, undercut, sit back, turn like carry tiger to the mountain. Step out, one, two, three, out. Step up, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Sit back, slice around. One, two, three. Lift the knee. One, heel kick. Two, three. Back. One, two, forward three. Over the top. One, undercut two, sit back three, turn, press stance, back to center, push the sword forward, sit back, turn, they're going to repeat this movement, step forward, over the top, undercut, Sit back, turn, undercut, uppercut like this, and then back down. Thrust. Sit back, and then we're going to push the sword forward. Sit back. Shift weight forward. Here's your half step. And poke. Put the, hand, the sword on your tricep upper arm area. Lift over the head. 
turn, drop it down the other side, cut to the left, cut to the right, over the top, one, turn, lift, chop, and set up like this and turn. One step, two step, that's a sliding step, turn, press, turn, and set up. Bring it over the top. One, two, three, and then we repeat what we just did. That's one, two, and three. Step forward and poke. Sit back, retreat, one, two, and then we're going to do it again. Cross step, cross behind, spin, and switch feet. Take a step forward, sit back and turn to the back corner and stab down. Bring the sword to here. We're going to spin on this foot, chop down, and poke. Sit back, turn, diagonal flying. center, then it's like the chicken nodding its head, so it's like a pigeon, two, three, one, two, okay, let's try that again, one, two, three, four, now we're going to turn, chop down, downward posture, step up, one, two, three. Push the sword forward. Level it up. Slice toward the neck. Sit back. Now we're in the horse stance on this side. Okay. Then we're here. One, two. Okay, let's try that again. So we're here. So downward posture, one, and we're here. Okay, so we're in the diagonal flying again. Okay, let's try that again. So from the downward posture, we shift, step up, poke, lift, push forward, and chop. Sit like this. Now we're in horse stance again. And then we step up. One, two, three. This time we go like this. Cross behind. Palm thrust. That's a willow palm. Take a step. And poke. You want to try that again? We're here. One. We hop. Two. Just sink the elbow, bring the sword against this, cross behind and thrust. Step out and poke. Sit back like this. Now we're going to the right. <clears throat> I'm going to switch the sword to the left hand. Two. Then we're going to go to this side. Three. And chop. Two hands on the handle. Stab down, turn, and poke. Okay, sit back. One, two, three, four. Step. One, two, three, four. Underneath the leg, lift. Bring the sword around. One, two, Three. Now that's in your left hand. Switch to your right. Four. Okay. One. Two. That's like this. One. Two. 
three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. And that completes the form. So sequentially, it's pretty long. It would probably take about five minutes, four to five minutes to do the whole set. So it's you know, a lot of movements, a lot of repetition, and it's really hard to track if you've never done a weapon. And you know, Tai Chi forms are fairly long to begin with. But then you know, how do you learn all of these? The same process as learning uh, any of the Tai Chi forms. So a prerequisite to the Tai Chi apparatus is actually doing uh, one of the Tai Chi sequences at least. Um, if you learn the long form, you've actually gone through the process of learning a sequence that would take you 15 minutes to 17 minutes to do so you're already familiar with uh, what it takes to memorize a form. So when, you, you know, when, when you're dealing with sequential type things, especially long forms, it does take you know, a period of time for your body to absorb the information. That's one thing. The other thing is that for it to get into your long-term memory, it really takes about four to six weeks of you know, regular practice for it to actually sink in. And then once it sinks in, so you can imagine the first week, it's six weeks later, the next series moves to six weeks later, Next year is six weeks later. So it depends on how many groupings of those six weeks that you put together and you string it together. That's why it does take, you know, a bit of time to learn it. Now, once you've learned a sequence and you've developed a knack for memorizing sequence because of the process, then you start to learn forms um, more efficiently because now your brain has been kind of molded into learning uh, those type of things. So... Uh, amazingly, we we are capable of doing this, and you know I call them files. You you store these files of sequences in your brain, and eventually you draw off them. Eventually, it just gets embodied into your system, and everything that you do becomes innate. It becomes part of you know uh, your normal you know apparatus. It becomes your normal uh, way of moving. So the agility of your footwork, the coordination of the hands, and all of that starts to uh, become very uh, part of your, your system. Your proprioceptive memory really, and reflexes really is heightened to a whole different level. So we're going to go through it again. And we can see that some of the movements are sort of right out of the empty hand form. So empty hand meaning you're not holding an apparatus. And you push forward. Then we have the slices. One, two, three, four. And then the fluid movements become just like your other form. It starts to blend together and you start to make the movements much more connected. Now, just like in a Tai Chi form, there is finishing movement. So you have to finish the movement before moving on to the next. Otherwise, you really won't be teaching your body, you know, the correct positions. That's all, aside from sequential memory, the muscle memory for the positions. And the reason why the apparatus becomes a little bit challenging is because all your movements are magnified, so the misalignment of the movements really show up. Then 
the timing where the hands and legs have to work together, become much more apparent. Over here. So we did. I think I lost my place. So we're here. Diagonal flying. One. Two. Here. One. Two. Three. Turn. Here. Now, once we're here, we push forward. So this is the slice to the neck. So that might be a little bit different from what you're used to. So when we step up, you bring it around like this. That goes over in front of the face, different from going over the head. So we slice to here, then we just turn and do this. So let's review that for a second. So we go down, we step up, poke, sit back, push, and come around and chop. Okay, that's a little bit different from what you used to. Then when we're here, this is like this, and then together. This stays like this, and then this, keep it in line, as we turn to that direction, and then we're here, okay? Then we slice, we switch the hands, which is kind of unique as a left-sided movement in the form. And when we go like this, we step down. Now here's a two-handed sword movement. Then we go like this and stab. Then we chop down and poke. Now we're gonna go back to here. This is fairly unique as well. When we chop down and we flick the sword up and then chop down. So that chopping down is the timing here. And then we turn, switch to the left hand again, switch back to the right, and we bring it to here, and we cut to the left just like before. And then we're gonna go over the head, lift the sword, Bring this hand down to brush, bring this hand to push and chop, and then we're here. This is the brush knee to closing. Then we turn back, one, two, three. So let's, let's do that again, right? Now let's do it from here, because I think this is a little bit confusing. When we switch the hands, we sit back, lift, cup to the waist. This is something that happens over there too as well. You know, instead of doing this, we just go from here. So you can see that actually is a movement that we already, a sequence that we've already kind of gone through and then we're here. And we're here and we push and then we turn, one, two, three, four, and end. One, two, three, four, and end. Okay. So all is 
couple of circles. But we have to time the movement with the leg and the shift and the adjustment and the push now. So, so there's a lot of synchronization. So I did it a little bit more synchronized. <clears throat> so can you see when you break down the movement, that's how you learn it. And as you start to identify some of the movements, then you can see that when you poke down, your hand is there. When you're sitting, the hand is here. So these are what, what postures are, okay? When the hand is here and you chop, when the hand is here and you chop. When you look at the position, you want to be pretty symmetric. When you chop down, like you're slicing down and poking, that's, you want to poke here. It's not there or there. You have to be there. And then you're back to here. Now, if I turn like this, the sword, if you look on the side mirror, the, on my body is like this. So when I'm sinking and I turn and I turn, these are positions that you have to kind of realize. So the, all these little uh, manipulations that take you to a position to allow you to create the next movement is the setup. So your body really has to begin to recognize all of these different skeletal positions in order for us to hold the sword to do. So one of the big mistakes a lot of people do when they're first learning the broadsword or any weapon, in fact, is to overgrip the sword. If you overgrip the sword, your wrist actually doesn't move because you've you've tightened your hand and the wrist becomes firm, like you're throwing a punch. If you grip your hand, your wrist becomes this. If you have muscle tension here, your wrist ends up like that. If you have muscle tension below, your wrist ends up like that. So your sword actually has combinations of both of these positions. So while this is neutral, you have a right and left, or up and down. So your wrist actually has to accommodate those positions, and it can't really accommodate it if the hand's excessively tight, because what drives the hand are the muscles here. So if the muscles here are too tight, your fingers are going to be tight, and it just compounds everything. So when you try to flip the sword, you really can't. So there's a, about, uh, a lot of dexterity in holding something as, uh, you know, as barbaric as this of some people would think. It's like chopping with an axe. But you can't even chop with an axe if you're holding it too tight. And if you don't release, if you were chopping wood and you're just holding it tight, the shock from that goes into your hand and then you end up with carpal tunnel syndrome. Or if you're holding it too tight and you do this, eventually the head of the axe would break. So with this, it's, the idea is to slice, to slice. And you can't slice if you're holding it too tight. You have to have pressure in one direction, but not holding it firmly and become stiff. So that's really something that you have to understand. And when you do this, the, the tiger's mouth, which is that area in here, is what is against the handle. And when you flip it, you can keep it there by some pressure on the thumb, and that's all you need to do. So I'm not... See, I'm not using the fingers, exaggerating that so you can see that I'm not really gripping it. So now when I do it like this, my fingers are releasing but not opening so you can see that I'm just really not doing much with the hand. So here I'm just flipping. And with the wrist, you have to actually include the shoulder and the elbow. When we're like this, relax the shoulder sink the elbow. That's vertical elbow, and that's horizontal elbow. That's you know, All you need to know is vertical and horizontal. Uh, this is something that's a closing like this. Okay. So that's poking down toward the leg. That's poking down toward the leg. So that's the direction that's the direction. 
This is chopping. This is chopping. This is poking. So chop and poke, chop and poke. In fact, when I first learned this form, this was in the middle somewhere, and then here at the end, it's actually those are the same, but because this stance is actually uh, how one of the you know senior senior Wu style Tai Chi practitioners did it, uh, I decided that at the end of the form, instead of using this one again, we would do use this one and use this one just as a variation of the stance position. So that's a modification from what I've learned. But it's not an invention on my part. It's just capturing the image of another teacher, uh, Hu Nam, who was, you know, he was probably like 108 years old before he passed away. Uh, he's a teacher with the little goatee. He was a very well-known Wu style Tai Chi. In fact, he came up with the first book on the Tai Chi broadsword and, um, I mean, that's not no longer in print, but that was probably in the early 1900s. So uh, that's where that position came from. So there's a little tidbits that um, I'm sharing with you so you know some a little bit about the form. Uh, I think we're almost time. So on that note, I think um, we can end this class. And oh, we got 10 minutes? OK, so um, we have another 10 minutes. So. Right now, it should be over now. So, how, how many? Oh, four minutes. Okay, so, yeah, so that's what I wanted to get across here. So what do you do is practice just um, sequentially, you can go through the uh, tutorial, the ones that are archived. A lot of the things that I'm doing as uh, um, basics are in some of the previous uh, sword uh, videos that have been archived. So you can, I don't know which one is which, but because each class is slightly different, but you can just remember that when we start, and if you're, if you're just tuning in and you hold the broadsword, the back of the blade is always against the crook of the elbow, and when you hold the, the handle, it's not on the butt. It's over closer to the hilt, and it just kind of sits here and rests there like this without gripping it, because you can't really control anything when you over grip it. So you have to learn to get an a feeling experience of what this feels like to be here. Now, if you're gripping it here, you can't bend your elbow. So you really, if you're going to do this in the form, and you switch to this, to the other side, or you switch to here, and you push, and you slice, and you slice, you have to give yourself enough flexibility or release the tension in the joints. So that should be learned when you're doing the Tai Chi form as well release the tension in the joints to create movement. And while we're moving through space, we start to develop better alignment of the movement and manipulation of this blade. So because this is a saber, it has the back side is not sharp. That's the side you use to parry or deflect. And the front side, the front blade, is for slicing and obviously for poking. And then if you look at the handle, there's an ergonomics here that's designed for this uh, specific weapon, and it's got a curved handle here. So that handle resembles the handle on a hammer. So the hammer isn't really straight. It has this curve because they figure out ergonomically that when you slice down like this, there's an advantage to have it slightly curved like that so you can trans transfer the force to the tip or the edge of the apparatus. In this case, it's the sword, but if it was the hammer, it would be the, the little head of the hammer. That's the goal of that is to drive a nail. So when you do that, it has a natural position. And if you notice, when we poke like this, the wrist is curved here to compensate for the curve there. So what curves down allows that to curve up, and then you have a straight line and a thrust. So those, it's already designed in the weapon so that your skeleton can work with this apparatus and have uh, a natural motion that isn't in conflict. Now, we did this with the tight wrist. Now you can't poke forward because it's pointing up there. 
So you can see why you would have to allow your hand to adapt to the weapon to create the position. Just like when I'm here, I adapt to the position so I can slice. I adapt to the position and slice. So one other thing that when you're slicing across in a horizontal direction, just like holding the ball, your elbow is lower than your shoulder. And that's because if you go like this and you keep your, uh, your elbow as high as your shoulder, your shoulder's not in a natural position, and what's going to happen is you're going to injure your shoulder. So the reason why you can drop the arm and go in that direction is because the, the shoulder now is relaxing, and when it's slicing through, you're not use, utilizing a shoulder joint that's conflicting with the position that you're trying to, to do, and you'll end up uh, doing it with the shoulder up. But you'll end up hurting, you're going to end up hurting your joint. You're going to injure your shoulder because it's not in the right position to do a horizontal slice with something in your hand. So on that note, uh, we're going to end it. Follow us on Facebook or any of the social media, and I'll see you next week. We'll go through it again. Hopefully you'll practice this week, and you'll be able to pick up a lot more. All right, on that note, I'll see you next week.